Hello and good morning, good afternoon everyone. My name is Claude Tetelin and I'm working at the GS1 Global Office in the team devoted to AIDC standards and technologies. Before joining GS1, I was leading an RFID lab in the University of Marseille in the south of France. And I was involved in many different research projects involving solution providers and end users. I quickly understood that even if you propose technical improvement to make RFID even more efficient, you have to keep in mind that the end users want to rely on stable technologies and standardized solutions. Just because the technology that they will deploy has to demonstrate a proven return on investment. So even if the role of a research lab is to invent new ways to improve the technology, you have to keep in mind that you cannot only propose disruptive modification and that you have to take into account the existing deployment and think about backward compatibility. So as a researcher, all your projects should be balanced between disruptive innovation and simple improvements. At the end, everything will have to be standardized in order to have a chance to be accepted by the market. And this is exactly what we are doing at GS1, because we believe in the power of standards to transform the way we work and live. So let's start with a very short presentation of GS1. We are an international and not-for-profit organization that develops standards for increasing efficiency, safety and visibility of any kind of supply chain across multiple sectors. The entire set of standards are based on the three following pillars – identify, capture and share information between stakeholders. We served more than 2 million companies around the world in 150 different countries. We are mainly known for the EA and UPC barcode that you can find on every single product in the retail industry. But we are also known to be the organization which standardized the RFID air interface known as EPC Class 1 Gen 2. Before focusing on RFID, I would like to say a few words about the difference between barcode and RFID encodings. First, in many barcode symbologies, you can encode identifiers together with additional information, like in GS1128 or in data matrix. These information are just encoded one after the others. Second, in barcode, the identifier don't need to be serialized. Think about the GTIN encoded in EAN or UPC barcodes. If you buy two identical bottles of water, they will have the same GTIN. On the contrary, in RFID, the identifiers shall be serialized and unique. In RFID, any additional information you want to encode has to be stored in the dedicated user memory bank. What is important to keep in mind is that all these different data carriers shall be interoperable because not a single technology can answer all the different business needs. In the different GS1 standards, we need to take into account the different ways people want to make use of RFID. So let's take two examples and let's start with the retail sector. This sector is known to be one of the key drivers for RFID adoption. For retailers who sell products from different manufacturers and brand owners, it's important to rely on a clear and unambiguous identifier. That's why SGTIN, the Serialized Global Trade Item Number, is widely used. It's a very simple and efficient way to leverage from the existing use of GTIN encoded in EAN or UPC barcodes. Together with the RAIN RFID features, SGTIN is a key for improving inventory management, and such improvement in turn allows to set up new services like omnichannel and online shopping experiences. It is worth noting that SGTIN can be encoded in 96 bits, which allows the use of low memory and therefore low cost RFID chips. Of course, SGTIN is not the only identifier the retail sector can leverage from. For example, an ITIP uniquely identifies different pieces of a trade item that cannot be sold separately, like a pair of shoes. 
Retail is not the only industry that benefits from GS1 identifiers. The healthcare sector widely uses GS1 standards, and more and more stakeholders implement RAIN RFID technology. In order to comply with regulations, a combination of SGTIN, batch lot number, and expiry date has to be associated with every single product. This association of GS1 identifiers and additional information can be encoded in RAIN RFID tags, but it is worth noting that due to the fact that the serial number can be up to 20 alphanumeric strings, the SGTIN 198 syntax has to be used. And this often implies that the other additional information has to be encoded into the user memory of the RAIN tag. Therefore, when you want to inventory healthcare products, you will have to access the user memory of every single tag, and this will drastically increase the time required for such inventories. Of course, JS1 cannot say to the healthcare sector to implement RFID the same way the retail sector does, so we need to provide a specific answer. So how to solve the requirement to encode more information than just a simple and short identifier in an RFID tag? Here I propose three different ways. First, you can tell the end user to encode very short identifier in the EPC memory. And if they need more information about the product, they can use the identifier as a key to access this additional information stored in databases. Do you think that this will be satisfying? Probably not, because even if the inventory will be fast enough, the access to additional information may take time. Furthermore, this requires to set up databases that can be shared between stakeholders with all the security issues that might occur. And what about filtering products based on the additional information? Think about a fresh product that needs to be removed from the shelf because of an expired based before date. That's impossible to do without accessing to the database first. The second option is to increase the data rate between the readers and the tags. And I'm sure that you will love this solution because it implies a lot of research and because it requires a lot of different skills. This could be a good solution, but don't forget that this requires important changes in the air interface, and if you want to be backward compatible, you will have to keep the previous modulation schemes available. So think about a mixed population of tags. Some will support this new feature, others not. And last but not least, you will still have to comply with the existing radio frequency regulations. So this can be a good approach but do not hope that this can be implemented quickly. The third solution is about changing the air interface protocol and ask the tags to backscatter the content of the user memory during the inventory run. This will prevent the end users to access every single tag after the inventory in order to read the content of this user memory. This is fully backward compatible with the existing air interface protocol and does not require too many changes. So when undertaking research in the RFID landscape, just remember that RFID is not only about radio frequency, but also about identification. The GS1 standard helps the different sectors to build the numbering system that best fits their needs. Furthermore, remember that these identifiers have to be encoded in either an optical barcode or an RFID tag. So what I want to emphasize here is that if you only focus on technical improvement without taking into account the business need and what's really implemented in the market, the solution that you will develop will hardly have a chance to be on the market one day. End users will deploy RFID if they are sure that the technology will not change every single day. Otherwise, they will always postpone their investments waiting for the technology to be stable enough. Nevertheless, here are some examples of improvement that GS1 members are expecting. Let's talk about the RF link. Of course, tag sensitivity is a key factor, not only because a better sensitivity can increase the reading distance, but also because it increases the read rate at a given distance. 
Together with the tag sensitivity, the reader sensitivity has also to be improved. Otherwise, the maximum reading distance will be limited by the reverse link. The backscattering efficiency is another key factor. In order to avoid the tag overdrive, this backscattering efficiency shall be as constant as possible and shall not change with the amount of power received by the tag. Finally, tag performance is one thing, but what is very important is the tagged item performance, because tags are always associated or attached to products. The tag item performance protocol, TIPP, has to be improved in order to take into account the new RFID application and ways to implement readers. For example, smart cabinets are more and more used in the healthcare sector, as well as in industrial sectors for tool management. A second set of improvements are linked to the tag design. End users require to have smaller and smaller tags in order to be able to embed these tags directly in products. In the same time, they also want to be able to read these tags at a greater and greater distances. As always, there is no one tag fits all, but it could be interesting to design tags that are less sensible to the environment. The auto-tuning of RFID chip is interesting, but new antenna designs could help answering the business need. As everyone is talking about IoT, many hand users would like to make use of RFID for passive sensor networks. Energy harvesting for small batteries can help implementing passive sensor networks that could be interrogated using a simple RFID air interface. RFID for location purposes is also of interest for many sectors, even if there are more and more other competing solutions. A last topic I would like to raise is the question of product authentication. I'm not talking about using passive UHF RFID for access control, but since there are more and more ownership transfer in the life of any kind of retail products for circular economy purpose, the question of the product authenticity becomes crucial. Creating crypto suites that are efficient enough for such application but that does not require too much resource is something more and more required by the market. In conclusion, I would like to say that even if GS1 can be seen as a standard organization which focuses on data sharing processes between business partners, the research trends is something that is of great importance for us and our members. That's why we set up a partnership with six different universities in the US, in Europe and in Asia under the AutoID Lab umbrella. Of course, this does not prevent us to set up other partnerships with laboratories, especially working on blockchain, artificial intelligence, big data and of course RFID. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation and do not hesitate to come back to me or to GS1 should you have any question about our standards or about innovation projects that you may have.